Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Hi, I made it. Excellent. <laughs> All right, it's just about 6.30. There's lots of faces here, it's wonderful. And I can't see everybody. Is Director Roberto here? So Joanna has not joined us yet, um, but okay. I think you can get started without her and she'll probably okay. join us shortly. OK, just so we can keep on time. Yes, absolutely. All right. Okay. Um, I just texted her and she said she's joining. OK, excellent. Um, Trustee Gibson, would you have the land acknowledgement there or does somebody have that that they'd be able to read? I don't have a copy of it here. Absolutely. OK, would you mind doing that? Nope, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you so very the, much. The Grand Erie District School Board recognizes the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe as the traditional peoples of this territory. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for sharing these lands in order for us to continue our work here today. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for attending tonight's event. Uh, it looks like we have a lot of people here. That's wonderful. Uh, my name is Sarah Nickel. For those of you who don't know, I am the chair of the Grand Erie Parent Involvement Committee. Um, it was through other events that we've had that we came up with this list of um, ideas for speaker events. Uh, so I'm really glad to see that there are so many people here joining us. Um, tonight we will be learning from many different uh, employees of the board, um, coordinated somewhat, I think, through by Christine Bibby, who is our safe and inclusive schools lead. Uh, she's helped to put together this uh, fabulous list of speakers, and I'm looking forward to learning and unlearning tonight. So Christine, would you like to take it away? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I'm actually going to pass it right over to Jenny. So Jenny Gladys, you're up. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, so welcome parents and guardians. Uh, tonight's event is of course presented by the Grand Erie Parent Involvement Committee. And the topic we'll be exploring yeah. is how to be an ally to marginalized students. Yeah. I'm Jenny Gladish. I work in communications and community relations for Grand Erie, and I'll be moderating what is sure to be a meaningful discussion on an incredibly important topic. I'll just uh, get a couple of brief housekeeping notes out of the way before we get started. In order to, uh, we're all working in our home environments and that sort of thing, and as we know, they can be noisy places. So I do ask that unless you're speaking, um, please mute your mics. And I'll ask that uh, uh, maybe we also turn off our cameras um, just to give the speaker the spotlight uh, as they're um, taking the floor. And uh, that should help things flow really well tonight. Um, please note that there will be a question and answer session happening at the end of this event. So at that time, if you feel so inclined, please feel free to turn on your mics and turn on your cameras. Um, of course, you can always leave a comment or a question in the dialog box. You'll find that somewhere at the top of your screen. Uh, feel free at any point uh, during this event to throw a question in there. Um, or a train of thought or a comment, and we will do our best to moderate that and get to as many questions and uh, inquiries from our parents and guardians as we can. Okay, so it is an honor to introduce you to the panel members joining us. I'll start with a very special guest. Jean Samuel has worked in the diversity field for more than 20 years, and her most recent role was as the Provincial Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies. She's a trained facilitator in anti-racism and anti-oppressive practice and has been working with our board to further our equity work. Thank you so much for being here today. We can't hear you, Jean. Can you turn your mic on and give us a hello and... Hello, I do that Perfect. all the time. Put it on. <laughs> but thank you. 
I feel so privileged to be with you all again, and I'm looking forward to this interesting dash that we're going to have. Virtual school being an ally to my. Fantastic. And joining us from the Grand Erie community is uh, a wonderful panel, uh, starting with Jeff Benner. He's the principal of Hagersville Secondary School, the co-chair of the Safe and Inclusive Schools Committee, previous chair for Grand Erie's Day of Dignity Committee, and he's been instrumental in the planning of Grand Erie's Rainbow Ball event. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, also joining us is Catherine Cottrell. She's teacher and department head of Canada and World Studies at North Park Collegiate and Vocational School. She's co-founder of the school's anti-bullying project and a longtime student council advisor. Thank you so much for joining us today, Catherine. Thanks for having me. Hello. We're also welcoming Cassidy Guzar. She has a long job title, so I hope I get it right. She's English as a second language, English literacy, development teacher consultant for English language learners in kindergarten to grade 12. She's also a member of the Safe and Inclusive Schools Committee and the International Welcome Center Committee. Thanks for being here, Cassidy. Pleased to be here. Thank you so much, Danny. Also joining us is Jeannie Martin. She is Grand Erie's Native Advisor Teacher Consultant and is a member of the Native Advisory Committee, the Indigenous Education Advisory Committee, and is part of the Cultural Competency Training Series for Grand Erie staff, the Indigenous Land-Based Education Project, and the Indigenous Student Leadership Initiative. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Thank you for having me tonight, Jenny. And finally, I'd like to welcome Joseph Tice, better known as Coach Joe. Joe is Grand Erie's Indigenous Education Lead Teacher Consultant and has worked as itinerant teacher for Indigenous engagement and support. He's also a former secondary teacher and coach. Thanks for being here, Joe. Joe, your mic is muted. But I remember to turn on the camera. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. Glad to be here. So to help us situate tonight's topic and, and put things into some context for the discussion we're going to have, I'd like to invite Jean Samuel to open things up and provide us with a bit more of an understanding of what exactly it means to be marginalized, the types of forms that marginalization can take, and what does it mean to be an ally? Jean, I'll turn the mic over to you. Great. Thank you for that so much. And this is so fabulous to have um, this space for uh, parents and others to come and have this um, critical conversation about marginality and oppression and how it impacts our uh, school systems and, and the work that parents can do to be allies to um, equity and social justice. And so when we're talking along the lines of marginality and oppression, we are talking about the historical experiences of um, individuals that are um, experiencing themselves uh, on the margins of society and find themselves tar targeted for no other reason than their social location and their, their identity. So basically it's just what you're born into um, takes you uh, away from the experience of, um, experience of fullness of life. And so, um, you know, we often speak about marginality um, in relation to individuals who have a different experience um, and, and are often looked at as having a, a privilege, whether they um, understand themselves to have privilege or not, and are coming from a dominant space. And it's really built along the lines of history and legacy of um, uh, oppression, along the lines of race, sexual orientation, uh, class, um, mental health, disability. And so, you know, understanding the concept of marginality is really understanding that one's lived experience, if you don't hold a social identity um, that is uh, marginalized, is quite different. Um, and, and uh, you know, in my work to share with schools the, the need to understand the different lived experience is, is such a separate conversation from what we, we need to center in, in work 
on truth and reconciliation. And so oftentimes people want to collapse these two things together. But the indigenous experience in Canada as the first peoples um, is quite unique and different and really shouldn't be brought into this conversation of marginality and equity and uh, social justice unless indigenous peoples uh, want that to to happen and that's why you will see two separate journeys and i know we have someone will, that will be focusing on that and so how um you know a parent perceives themselves in the world uh, and the world around them particularly along the lines of um, marginality and oppression and whether you hold that or not is, is critically important to how a, a child uh, will develop in their lived school experience and in the educational system. And so it's really, really important that parents understand that they also need to understand what marginality and oppression is and need to be really, really self-reflective on how they feel more about themselves um, in relations to others that don't hold the same social location and identity. I think it's critically important because the experience that your child has and other children have is not void of what we are seeing in everyday society where discrimination, oppression along some of the lines that I've mentioned, uh, class, uh, poverty, um, uh, mental uh, health, different degrees of mental wellness, race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, and in particular gender nonconformity, it, it is brought into uh, school systems and thrives within school systems, not because school systems house these things or, or that um, it's developed there, but just because the the in um, the systems of schools are inherently uh, represent uh, a representation of our community and of us, and as such, then we we have to infer and we know that it's inherent that these experiences are within schools, and so as it's it's really critically important that parents understand that some of the the work that they need to do to understand when their child is um, uh, not having good experiences could be in relation to their social identity of either being marginalized or of uh, coming from a, a privileged experience. And this is sometimes hard to grasp because no one wakes up in the morning and says, well, I, I'm, I am privileged and, and, you know, see me roar or really uh, understands that that privilege exists. But what it does do is can infer a differ, differential experience for uh, the child in the school and some are able to thrive in, in ways that others are not. And, and the research really does support that. So, um, you know, many of us as parents really believe that our kids um, and our children, uh, when they go into the school environment, that um, they, they will do uh, exceedingly well. This is what our hope is for our children. And that's why we engage them in education. But I don't think we give enough uh, credence to understand that particularly those students that are coming from marginalized experiences and yeah. um, those that are indigenous have a very different experience within the Canadian school system. And there has been research ad nauseum uh, to show the impacts uh, for yeah. students who are coming from these marginalized spaces on the ability to thrive and strive and feel really, really welcome and included in the school spa space. So um, the parent is really a part of the, the important fabric to understand that we have to have critical understanding of ourselves and critical understanding that we need to be um, speaking to our students about some of the larger social issues that uh, we see playing themselves out within our current context in 2021 uh, with uh, um, you know, social justice movements, not only through Black Lives Matter, but also through um, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, the call to understand poverty in a different way, uh, sexual orientation in a different way, and the indigenous experience in a different way. And that sometimes we can be barriers to the, the success that our, our children have within school systems because we're not uh, paying attention to this unique human experience that is so different for those that are um, finding themselves on the margins. And um, it creates emotional, psychological, um, sometimes even physical. The bullying that I see and hear about in school systems are often wrapped around these areas of uh, oppression based on social identity um, and location. And so parents have to really deeply understand that if we don't address what some of the things that we see in schools in regards to inequity and uh, social injustice, that uh, the, the development of the children um, is, is really at risk. And, and the, the key part of the risk is their spiritual and mental wellness, uh, because the, the experience on a day-to-day -day lived experience really robs students of uh, the humanity that every human being is trying to grow and thrive and live into. So while educators in school systems, you know, do the best that they can to promote equity for all, we are seeing the research, and I know that Grand Deary District School Board has um, recently uh, started to dive in so into some of this research and data. And, um, you know, it, it's along the lines of what we are seeing in the larger society of um, the issues on in, of inequity and who is most impacted by those issues, we are seeing the same in the school experience. And so we, we have to, as parents, start to drop ourselves into understanding there's more that we need to do to be speaking to our kids about social justice and uh, inequity and uh, understanding that some of the struggles that our own children are experiencing may be attached to who they are and how they are uh, received, uh, included or not included uh, within school systems. And so, um, you know, what can parents do? I think we have to ask more critical questions of ourselves in relation to how we uh, are situating conversations around social justice and inequity. And we have to definitely be asking more pivotal questions. The question about how was school today needs to be really, really uh, teased out uh, because many of the, the experiences of our, our own children um, across the, um, you know, different uh, areas of social identity and location uh, are marred in schools because of who they are. And so um, I, I think that's where I'll wrap it up by, by saying we need to be listening and asking deeper questions of some of the issues, concerns, and worries that our children have in their school experience. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jean. It really helps uh, situate this discussion we'll be having today. Um, to the panel, and Jean, I invite you to, to weigh in anywhere um, you see uh, fit, but how do we start to create these safe, supportive spaces for our students, and, and what does that look like in each of your roles? I'm thinking maybe Catherine can start things off by talking about what that looks like at uh, Unknown participant is now joining. Sure, thank you. Um, Thank you for that, Jean, too. Um, I love these opportunities just to listen to people um, talking about these issues and, and me reflecting on it in the school. Um, because with everything in the news right now, um, and as a history teacher, I'm very fortunate um, that the subject matter that I'm taking a look at um, comes up and that the kids are very interested about it. And I really think as teachers, and I see this definitely in the secondary panel, um, that it's all in the approach, um, the idea that we're partners with the kids in exploring these topics um, instead of the expert of all. Um, and that, you know, as an as an adult white female that I'm learning about these things and I'm expanding uh, my understanding and that I am sometimes going to make mistakes, um, but that I'm just I'm, I'm trying to learn. And I find that with the kids, 
If you express that you as an adult are willing and curious to learn about these topics, that the kids um, almost see it as more of a partnership with you um, and they're willing. Um, I taught world religions for 10 years and was teaching kids about religions that weren't mine, um, but then the kids would help to teach me. So I think if the approach is very um, open um, and the idea that, that it's a journey that we're learning together, I think that that's, um, that's really helpful for them. So. You're muted, Jenny. I knew that would happen at some point tonight. <laughs> um, Cassidy, I'm wondering what this looks like in terms of English language learners. How do we create those safe and inclusive spaces uh, where language and identity are concerned? Absolutely. Um, so everyone in a school community has an important role to play in supporting English language learners. Um, and as the teacher consultant of this portfolio, I do have the pleasure to support a truly unique and diverse population of our school board, that of our multilingual learners. Um, and so the student and the family is at the center of everything that I do, working to cultivate welcoming, safe and engaging learning environments. Um, to ensure that there's success for all. And this starts as soon as the new student and their family enters school to partake in what's called a welcome and reception meeting, where they're warmly greeted by school staff and have opportunities to ask questions about the Ontario school system and to receive a supported entry into the school. And so in the classroom setting, I have the privilege of collaborating with teachers to implement culturally responsive teaching practices. And culturally responsive teaching practices um, integrate the student's background knowledge, their linguistic and cultural diversity, and prior home and community experiences into all of the learning activities in the classroom. And it recognizes that students learn differently and that these differences do in fact matter. Thanks so much for that. I love your emphasis on on family. You know, you're working just as much with families as you are with your students. And uh, and it's it's definitely it takes that entire effort for sure. Do any of our other panelists want to uh, let us know about what uh, what their specific roles look like in terms of creating safe and inclusive spaces? Sure, I'll, I'll hop in. I have, my, I have my, my mics on. Good. OK, um, I think the one thing I like to, to emphasize here is uh, we just had a, a couple of a presentations by Nikon Sinclair, uh, one for an after school and one for uh, our administrators. And something that I really want to I'm kind of proud of our board is there's a lot of I, I call them brave, brave administrators um, who have contacted me um, and being honest about their, their level of knowledge. They're 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 brave. Let's say I, I, I don't know very much. How do I start on my journey towards uh, reconciliation or or uh, having more Indigenous education built into our, into our program? So I think that's uh, that's really been a great first step as far as our, our cultural competency plan has gone, and hopefully it, it trickles down and and creates a lot more safe spaces in our schools. Thanks so much, Joe. Maybe we can take this over to Jeff. Thanks, Jenny's. Um, so there are two parts of my role. One as the school principal. Um, I think what's really important, at least what I feel is important from the principal standpoint, is that you know, uh, when when working with students and, and their families and our community members, is that it's my job to listen for understanding and not with judgment, um, and to really take the opportunity to um, acknowledge and understand what their lived experiences are what they're experiencing within the walls of my school, what ex they're experiencing outside of the walls of my school and how that affects the learning that happens. Um, so I think that's a stance that I tend to take um, lots of times. I really like that Jean said, it's about the humanity of it. Um, and in and, and creating that safe space, you know, there's lots more that I think we'll get into later on tonight. But I think that's one of the biggest pieces as a as a as somebody who works with with, you know, family members, community members and my students, I think and my staff. I think that's really important. The other piece is in the work that we do at the Safe and Inclusive Schools Committee. Um, and one of our big parts of that um, is looking at our um, all of the policies that get 
that are put forward for review or new policies. And as a committee, um, we look at all the policies from that lens of equity and safe schools and inclusion. Um, and I think that's what part of the work that we do. We also look at how we can support um, administrators and teachers uh, in their work and in their development of their own skills and abilities. And then this is where part of um, our work with Gene started this year. Um, and certainly we engage with our, you know, our Indigenous education team as well and our community partners. Um, so those are kind of the big pieces. And as well, um, we spent a lot of time this year um, looking at our uh, equitable and inclusive schools policy for the board and how that will trickle down and, and work with um, all the policies that get put forward. So, you know, uh, while sometimes we don't see the policies, um, you know, on the ground level right away, they do really create, uh, you know, the path forward for us. So it's been really encouraging to to do that kind of work um, and as well as support, um, support events for our students. And Grand Erie's, you know, as a whole. So our Day of Dignity event where we invite um, participants from all of our high schools. And then, the, like you said before in that great intro, the Rainbow Ball, um, we're so large geographically, finding opportunities for our students to come together in a safe space for them to celebrate with each other has been really uh, unique, inspiring. And, and I think that's part of his leadership of my school and of, of the board that that's part of our role. For sure, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jeannie, what, is, uh, what does it look like in your role? You've been with Grandiri a long time and in different roles. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think um, what comes to the forefront of my mind is an initiative like our Indigenous Student Leadership Initiative, which is in its fifth year running now and is uh, a co-creator of that Unknown participant is now exiting. I can say, you know, we recognize the importance of being very intentional about creating a safe space for Indigenous student voice to be heard. And I think all of the, everyone who has spoken has um, alluded to the importance of creating that safe space. But I think, um, you know, there's also, it's equally important to provide students the tools to, you know, to use their voice, to help them build confidence to use their voice to um to support them when they use their voice so that they can see how to action what it is they want to see happen what they feel needs to happen so i think those are other pieces to creating a safe space um it's not just about hearing and um you know hearing what they have to say but also to support action and um and give and help them learn you know, the skills they need to learn to um, be agents of change. Indeed, thank you for that. This last year has brought a lot of eye-opening events on both an international and a local level to our awareness. I'm thinking of things like Black Lives Matter protests, hate crimes and harassment towards members of the Asian community to treaty rights demonstrations happening in our own district. How do these events affect our students and our kids? I'd be happy to speak to this, Jenny, um, to Thanks start so us much. Off. You're welcome. Um, so these events and others like it have um, and continue to impact our students. They reinforce how important it is for all individuals to be an ally for groups that are on the margins um, and to affect meaningful change through awareness and action. Our students truly need trusting networks of individuals uh, to feel well supported, to have challenging conversations, to talk about those difficult topics, and, and to ultimately address those, those acts of oppression. And as an ally, we can attentively listen and work to validate individual lived experiences and or reality in supportive and caring ways. Hi. Thank you for that. Jeannie, take it away. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely concur with um, uh, what Cassidy has, has to say there. And I think that, again, it goes back to, um, you know, we're educators. It's about educating kids. But parents are educators, too. They play a key role in 
ed educating their children. And I think, you know, with all that our kids are bombarded with in the media, it's, you know, important for us to help them acquire the skills to, to navigate all of that um, information and to learn how to think critically about it and to really look at information and be able to analyze it in a way that they're able to, you know, separate truths from fact, uh, I mean, truth from mistruth and um, fact from fiction and to, you know, draw some um, well-informed conclusions of their own that sometimes maybe um, do not align with, you know, our conclusions, but as long, I think it's important for us to support young people in drawing conclusions as well as well, as long as they're well-informed and um, reasonable conclusions. I think it's our role to help them, you know, find their way to those reasonable conclusions, even if we don't, they're not the same as ours. And to um, help them, uh, I guess, come to some resolution, because I think sometimes with all the media that they're bombarded with and, you know, mixed messages and competing mis messages, and it's hard for them to know what to believe sometimes with these different issues but i think we can help them again come to conclusion and then help them um action i go back to action again in a positive way because when we're dealing with very sensitive difficult challenging topics i think you know um our kids need us to help them figure out what they do with the information once they have drawn their own conclusions. So, okay, so how can you be an ally? What steps can you take? And uh, and then we, again, as educators and parents support them, how can we support them to do that? Jenny, can I jump in here? You sure can. Yeah, I think um, what, what Jeannie is, is saying is, is really, really pivotal that, you know, um, parents are the first teachers. Let, let's be honest and, and real about that. And I think um, the act of, of how we understand discrimination and oppression and our own socialization process and our own upbringing. Um, and, and as parents, we have to be critically honest about the messaging that uh, our children uh, receive uh, along the lines of um, discrimination, marginality and oppression. And we either work as parents to reinforce that or we work as parents to interrupt that. And so what is being said, done and enacted in the house um, as we see some of these very, very tenuous um, issues along the right lines of race and um, indigeneity and mental health. And even with, uh, you know, we have poor white children that attend a uh, Grand Erie District School Board. And so even the conversation around poor, poor white people is important for uh, parents to understand what they say matters and what they also not say um, when these issues are raised in the media, um, on the news, um, is as equally important. Uh, because this is learned behavior and taught behavior. We don't come out of the womb uh, thinking, feeling, and being discriminatory or oppressive to anyone. It's what how we are socialized in our environments at home, in our, uh, the churches we go to, the associations we, we um, uh, you know, uh, bond with, and, and the communities that we, we uh, experience ourselves with. And we know that um, Grand Erie District School Board and the region has always had Indigenous people, and yet still we have this anti-Indigenous kind of sentiment that is, uh, you know, throughout community. And so, so there's much that parents have to do to crit critically be honest about where they uh, are thinking, feeling, and being in relation to inequities that we see playing out in the world today. Thank you for that. Uh, Catherine, you're working with young adults every day. Uh, give us a sense of how is this in their awareness and, and how are they working through the complex feelings that result? Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, 
We start um, in grade 10 because I teach um, grade 10 history, right? And we find the grade 10 history course is a really um, sort of great foundational course to work with the kids where we talk about ethnocentrism, right? We talk with the kids about what does it mean to view the world from the perspective of your ethnicity and it's um, a bit of an awakening for the kids when we talk about it because they've only known the life that they have known. Similar to what Jean was just talking about, um, they don't realize the privileges that they feel or um, maybe the way that they look at the world differently than other people. So we find when we when we talk about that idea of what that means, it helps them with their own self-awareness and then helps them to feel a bit more comfortable than maybe exploring other topics, right? And then we take a look at, you know, at different religions and we take a look at different genders. But we find with starting off with ethnocentrism is a good sort of starting point for their own self-awareness that then we can explore um, other issues. And definitely um, the kids are very aware of these things that are going on. Um, they live them, they exist, and they see them on social media. And I find that they um, enjoy having um, a safe space with an adult sort of um, facilitating the discussion for them to openly express their views as well. Um, so yeah, and it really, um, it's very heartening to see how um, interested and involved and informed our students are on these really difficult topics. And a lot of the times they just want a forum to be able to discuss them, so. For sure, do any of our other panelists want to uh, weigh in on uh, on this question? Joe? Yeah, I'd like to, Jenny. Yeah, just kind of uh, uh, build on what Jeannie was saying before. I found early in the year in September, October, when Lambeck Lane was really in the news a lot, um, there's a lot of misinformation. And um, my, my first question to a lot of people, teachers and students, was, did you know? Very simple little things like that. That And, and, and to be honest, um, not being from here, I'm Anishinaabe from the Garden River First Nation, which is near Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, and I've never lived here, never lived uh, here very long. Um, I was learning a lot. So whatever I was learning from from our fellow Indigenous team members, um, I, I was sharing with those staff and students that I was working with. So um, again, to, to to get the facts, to what what's really happening versus all the misinformation that, that's going on in the uh, social media was really important at that time. For sure. Uh, Jeff, your school is uh, is located in, in Haldimand County, and uh, I'm wondering what uh, the impacts have been of the news of the last year or so um, for your community. Yeah, I think, thanks Jenny, I think there's, um, I think lots of emotions from the students run the gamut from, um, you know, from just not understanding and being confused, um, like we've said before, and I, and you know, Joe makes a great point. You know, did you know, right? And I think that's a big part of our job. Um, but then the other part is that you know, I think many of our students are are angry. I think they're scared, um, and. and and you know that uh, that combined with what we've been dealing with with the pandemic has really heightened all of those emotions and senses. So you know, creating that safe space is is really it's pivotal to you know. I come back to the learning that happens in school, and creating that space that safe space is really pivotal to our students being in a spot where they can learn, they can come together and collaborate and understand. Um, I think as our role, it's it's really important for us to give students the space to speak up and to be heard uh, and to participate in in what is happening in our communities um, and inviting their families and parents as part of that. Um, so those I think are, are really important. And I think the other thing that um, is challenging um, is to ensure that our students are seeing themselves represented in the curriculum. I think that is a part of our key, key things that we, you know, that really we must do is to ensure that our students, all of our students see themselves in the curriculum and see themselves in a space where they can succeed. Um, and by creating those safe spaces, giving opportunities to learn, create informed in decisions, um, to be heard, giving them power and decision making um, will hopefully also provide that sense of hope so that 
they can see uh, good things for their future and good things for the future of everyone. So, you know, th those are kind of, you know, based on everything that we've heard and heard from kids over the last few years, I think that instilling that sense of hope and by creating a safe space where students can learn uh, and seeing themselves represented and having that power is, is really important. It's a tall order, but it, it is good work and it's work that we should be doing and, and are doing every day. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, Jean, I'm hoping you'll be able to weigh in on this next question as well. Um, but I'm I'm wondering what forms does privilege take, and how do we acknowledge and work through our own privilege uh, to provide support for our students? Yeah, I think wherever you have um, marginality and oppression, you have privilege. So. Um, you know, if you are um, uh, someone that experiences uh, financial hardship and that's a marginal, a marginal experience, then there are those that are privileged by being uh, middle class, upper middle class um, and, and financially affluent. Um, you know, there's this conversation about the, the working poor and, 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 you know, is that a privilege? I, I mean, if you're finding yourself having to go to Money Mart or, or those pl places, that's uh, your, your one paycheck away from, um, you know, in, being in poverty. And, and so uh, on the lines of race, it, you know, there's racialized privilege and then there's white privilege. And, um, you know, it's it's a different, difficult conversation. Um, conversation to have, particularly if you have not sat in deep anti-racist uh, work and conversation and, you know, uh, individuals who happen to be white can get very, very what Robin D'Angelo, who is an anti-racist educator and, and studies the pedagogy of uh, race and racism, speaks to white fragility and the notion that there is this social construct that gives white people the benefit of not being at um, dis-ease in their own lived experience, in their own skin. And, and you know, not being non-white, you will never be able to fully, fully understand it unless you start to do deep anti-racist work as an individual who is white. And so as a um, heterosexual, I, am, uh, I have heterosexual privilege, um, meaning that um, you know, I was raised, um, religion was a part of, of um, my experience. And so, um, you know, I was taught that it's just male and females that have uh, relationships, let alone sexual relationships. And so I am always in recovery around the socialization on heterosexism and this idea that only male, female should have relationships. So no matter where you, you find um, marginality and oppression, the opposite to that is a privileged experience, whether you recognize it to be as not, you just get, you're able to cash in on the dividends of not having marginal experience. To the rest of our panelists, um, what role has privilege played in, in your own unlearning? I'd be happy to follow up, Jenny, um, and just in response to Jean's comment about wherever you have marginality, you have privilege. And this makes me think about how our multilingual students come to us with varying degrees of English language proficiency. And it's our responsibility to respond to these strengths and needs to ensure that our own privilege doesn't take hold. And so just um, to illustrate this further, multilingual learners um, who are in the midst of developing English can't be unfairly penalized for not having reached language proficiency with those students that speak English as a first language. And so in Grand Erie, uh, we use the Ministry of Education's framework called the Steps to English Language Proficiency to inform and guide the learning and assessment opportunities that we design and we present to our multilingual learners. And truly, this framework helps teachers to support a student's um, English language develop it, development, not focusing on what they can't do, but rather what they can do. Thank you. Um, any of the other panelists want to weigh in on the topic of privilege? I, 
Hi, Jenny. I think I can like, I can uh, pipe in here for a little bit. Is uh, you know, uh, being born and raised in Haldimand, um, and now you know, principling in Haldimand, and being uh, you know someone who's identifies as cisgender and white. I it is, you know. I need to understand that I will have biases I don't know I even have. Um, that I need to really recognize that, um, you know, just because it is the way it is doesn't mean that is the way it should be. Um, and so what's really important for me is to allow myself to have that um, open ears, open mind, um, and that understanding that, you know, I can't, I don't know everything, but I need to understand people's lived experiences as best I can. And again, that whole, for me, it's that listening for understanding, asking questions to understand and not judging that because I don't have the same experiences as my students or new families that move into the area or the families that we support um, who are indigenous. Um, so that I think is what's really important for me as a principal and to recognize that, you know, part of my privilege is what's gotten me to the the position that I'm in today. And I think I really have to now um, take stock of that, listen deeply, um, and then help um, my staff, um, who many of them are in the same position as me, um, in terms of being from Haldeman, being from, you know, a, a white family, um, to understand that, you know, we really have to uh, take out or be open for the for us to learn about our biases that we may not know we have, um, or to really understand what our biases are, and to ensure we don't bring those into the school, or work to mitigate them so that our students are uh, really feeling that 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 inclusion, that safety. Um, we won't get it perfect, but it's work that we need to show that we're doing, uh, and be very deliberate and. Um, vocal that we are trying to do that work so that we can uh, be accountable to ourselves and our kids and communities. Well said. Uh, Joe or Jeannie, anything to add to uh, to this discussion? Yeah, uh, to be honest, I haven't had a lot of uh, uh, experience dealing with this white privilege, but the one thing I have done recently um, in dealing with some, some fellow, fellow staff members is exactly what white privilege is. Um, it, and Jean described it great beforehand, but that word privilege gives that different meaning, like, oh, you're, 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 you're rich or whatever. No, it just means that you don't have to think about certain things. And it just, it just occurred to me that in all my years uh, going through school and, and talking with my friends, um, there was one story I told them about uh, going to baseball tournaments in northern Ontario. And my uncle's telling me there are some hotels that we don't even, tr don't even bother trying to enroll or uh, sign up at just because they knew. So it just occurred to me, just, just listening to everybody speak here about that a story from a long time ago. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jeannie, anything else to uh, to add to this, uh, this discussion? Not. Just listening to the discussion, I think about, um, you know, one piece about white privilege or privilege is that, um, you know, we're talking about creating safe space and you know allowing for the voices of uh, marginalized and indigenous people to be heard and and um a part of privilege is to actually have the choice to to provide that and to have the choice to on um, what you do with that you know it's not like um so that's there what therein lies the privilege it's not something that you um you know, for marginalized Indigenous people, they don't have, they can't opt in or out. You know, they're in it, they live it. But for a uh, part of privilege is that you actually, you have the option to opt out, I guess. And I think um, one of the things that we, you know, if we, um, we deal with is, you know, are we truly committed to, to change? And, and, you know, not just you know, making space to hear from marginalized and indigenous people, but to actually allow them to be decision makers, to be leaders and to follow that lead to, you know, and, and not and to not just to not just, you know, listen and check off the box that we listened, but to actually 
you know, be intentional about um, making change for the future and being a part of that change. So I think that that is a, a key part of being an ally. And that's for all. sure. I like what you said about, you know, having the option, you know, that's, that's privilege for many of us. Um, we do have that option and, and it's important to remember that that's a subtle form that it takes. Um, Catherine, anything to, uh, to sort of wrap up this question? Yeah, I was just thinking about how um, the discussion of privilege comes up in the classroom setting with the kids and how we talked about safe spaces. Um, just the idea uh, for parents, for educators, for everybody that when we're talking about these ideas, you, you create the space where the kids can volunteer information if they want to but not to ever put a child on the spot where um, you know you have a black student in class or you have an indigenous student in class or a student of any any group that we would say that maybe quote unquote we may view as marginalized or is marginalized um, and expecting them to sort of represent right um, if they if they feel that they would like to talk and volunteer that information but you don't ever want to put a child um, on the spot right and I think sometimes in our quest for learning more, we see them as these vessels of information, which they can be if they want to offer that, um, but just to allow the, the child to um, be the one who's taking the lead on that, not us as adults putting them in a place where they have to um, offer up stuff that they may not want to talk about at that time. For sure, thank you. We talk a lot about change on an individual level as well as on a systemic level. Uh, what needs to change about school boards the systemic level, if you will, uh, to better support in marginalized students. Maybe we can throw this one to Jeff. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so from, you know, thinking from my role as on the Safe and Inclusive Schools Committee, um, part, of, part of that, which I spoke to a little bit earlier is, um, that we have to look at uh, all of our policies and, and practices and procedures that we put in from a lens to ensure that that it is inclusive of all, all of our, it is an equitable piece. Um, and that's through all, every piece of, of um, from our marginalized students to um, their communities that we work with to their families and, and, and that big piece. And so that's one of the big pieces. Then the other piece is that um, ensuring that we embed those practices with our, our students and leaders. Um, and while looking at the, you know, going back to thinking about our procedures and policies, when we look at those, is it's all, it's trying to make things that are barrier free, looking at it from an anti-oppressive lens, um, which is challenging work. So um, it, we need to understand all of that and then apply it in, in our critical thinking around these policies and procedures. So that's, that's, that's kind of the big piece. And that comes from you know, uh, even working within our, our Grand Erie community and having representation on around the table from our Grand Erie community that can can help us all understand. Um, but then it's also part of the outreach to our communities and our students um, to make sure that comes in. Uh, and then when I go to my role as a principal, what's in, what I feel is important is that um, and what needs to change is that I need to see um, my staff reflective of my students, um, whether that's through racial diversity, um, staff who feel comfortable um, expressing who they are, whether with their, um, who their loved partners are, how they express themselves and, and you know, what gender they, they choose to identify with or not identify with, um, that's really important. Um, so I think that is that is a big piece for me as a principal. But then the other piece of that is um, is that it's not done in a tokenistic way, right? It is important for our students to really understand that they are represented in our in our staff. Um, and then further to that, and, and you know, kind of goes down the rabbit hole a little bit. But further to that is. Um, giving opportunity or, or not giving opportunities, but providing means for our students and staff to really um, develop their own skills, making sure that they have every opportunity in terms of staff, if they are looking in a leadership position, um, you know, providing those opportunities, showing them that they're, you know, 
breaking down the barriers that could be there in order for them to be successful in their own careers. Um, and, and once we once you see that, my hope is that our students will see their success. And, and so then they know, again, that sense of hope comes in as well. Um, but again, you know, Jeannie said, you know, Jeannie's so great. And she said it so well, is that providing the opportunity for students, but not forcing them into the opportunity, um, right? To really welcome and, and provide that welcoming space and open mind and open space for them to participate, but at their own choice and at their own time. Because I think that's one of the big things is that we, and, and I've certainly grown in this, you know, in my own journey is that, okay, let's put all these, you know, let's put all these opportunities out. It's great. We've got kids in there participating. They're learning. Great. We're done. Well, no, um, we're not done. And, and really creating that bigger space for those students to join when they're ready um, is what's important. So lots to change. I think, you know, the, the staff representation piece is really important for me. Um, and then as well as, you know, even things what we do in terms of how we put out communications to families, how we, um, you know, our posters in our school, what are our main foyers look like? And then it comes down even to physical spaces, right? How do we encourage more land-based learning within our schools um, so that everyone, you know, so that we, we have more um, better and diverse learning for all of our students? Really well said, Jeff, lots of points there. Um, Cassidy, I'm wondering, you probably get a big picture of, of school boards um, when you're working with uh, a lot of newcomers to Canada. I'm wondering uh, what needs to change about school boards from your point of view? Thanks, Jenny, absolutely. Um, so all stakeholders involved must think beyond the minimum expectation to foster thriving and dynamic um, school communities. The Grand Area District School Board continues to involve, um, evolve in response to the growing demographic population of those individuals learning English as an additional language. And we have roughly 1,700 English language learners in our system. And so, um, as an ELL team and as a larger system, we recognize that our work is truly never done uh, and we need to consistently challenge ourselves to create those safe and inclusive schools, uh, partnering so very closely with our families and valuing the many strengths that they share with us. Thanks so much for that, Cassidy. Um, Joe, over to you. I'm wondering if you can weigh in on this in terms of uh, in terms of how school boards need to change to better support our students. I don't know if I, I'd, I'd call it need to change. I think we need to keep going in the same direction that we're heading now. Um, there have been so many great um, uh, pro pro progressive uh, programs in the last progressive program in, a, in the past few years. Um, when I started as a grad coach four years ago. Um, that's when the student United Indigenous Student Council was starting, uh, and that's built up from a few schools to every school now having uh, representation. Um, we started a lacrosse project at different schools, and that really took off. Um, we're now building the land-based uh, learning education. We've added two new uh, people to our Indigenous education team, a principal leader and an uh, elementary engagement and support teacher. So I don't think we, we need to necessarily change. We just need to keep going in the direction we're going now. We have an Indigenous student trustee. So there's lots of things happening in, in, in a positive manner for our, for our kids and our students, so, uh, and our staff rather. And um, I think I think we're heading in the right direction. For sure, let's not forget the positive momentum that's generated. Uh, Jeannie, anything to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I, I do fully agree with, with Jeff. Like we need to have um, better representation across uh, across our staff of, of the student community that we serve and um but but we also need to i mean we have you know like joe said we're building our indigenous ed team and that is great you know it's great to have more um diversity in your staff profile but you also because we know from our uh, from the indigenous perspective from our community we know what we what needs to happen to make things better for our kids in schools. So, you know, make the space for the native voice to be heard. Make the space, but value that voice. 
you know, you have to be willing to value that voice by, um, I guess, you know, sharing some of the power to, to actually follow that voice, that voice's lead. And so I, I just, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to not just hear the voice, but also to be willing to, you know, share the power and let that voice, you know, lead. And, um, so I would say, I just wanted to add that part to, um, Jeff's comment. So. For sure. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Yeah, Jean, I'm hoping you can weigh in too. Yeah, I just want to uh, piggyback very quickly on on both uh, Jeff and and Jeannie's comments. In that, uh, you know, the type of leader, like you know, diversity and diversifying leadership uh, uh, at the board level is not just the thing to do. I think it is part of it, but it's the the type of leader that comes into those roles and positions now that is pivotally important. And so, are you a person centered um, and and a servant leader that understands that you have to um, situate how you think about others, how you value others, how you respect others, and, and allow their own independent thought about um, what needs to change within the Grand Erie, uh, Erie District School Board to, to kind of germinate and uh, come to fruition within your school board. Because, yeah, I think it was um, Albert Einstein said that the first sign of not being well is when you continue to do the same thing and expect the same result. And so that that's the part that I think is pivotal to, to the work that boards needs to do, is to really understand they cannot continue to do the same thing and they need a different type of leader. Very good point. Um, Catherine, I don't want to leave this topic uh, without inviting you to weigh in as well. Um, the, the Always as a teacher, um, it's the student voice to me that's always really important. Um, and I think that we're, again, talking about progress, the idea of how we've had student trustees now for a number, number of years. Um, for me, what I would see is the next step that would be nice would be if there is some sort of framework or way um, that we can ensure that the voices that we're hearing from the kids in the schools get to the trustee and then get to the board, right? So that there's sort of, um, I don't know if there's a process that we can develop or something, because the idea behind the student trustee is that they're talking to their classmates. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes there's certain pockets they talk to, there's certain pockets that they maybe don't talk to. So um, that's what I would love to see is sort of a next step going forward um, is some way that it can be a bit more integrated from the kids to the trustee to the board. Great, thank you for that. So obviously our audience uh, today is parents, uh, parents and guardians largely, um, to all of our panelists and, and to Jean, you know, what can parents do to support their own children and even their children's friends and, and social networks? Catherine, maybe we can uh, throw it back to you uh, just from the uh, perspective of a secondary teacher. Sure. Um, one thing I find in my classes and with my own um, children um, that I think for parents is very helpful and it's to me it's just so simple is just let them know that they can come and talk to you about these things. Um, if you let them know that you're you're here to listen to them and that you're um, here to learn with them and help them, I think sometimes that's really good. I know um, as a classroom teacher, whenever I sort of make that statement of I'm here for you if you need anything, then I will I will see kids coming forward more after that. So I think that's really helpful helpful. Um, I think it's also helpful for us like to read up on the topic. Um, I remember reading, you know, the idea that it's not enough just to be um, not a racist or not homophobic. You need to be anti-racist. You need to be anti-homophobic. Um, and so reading up on these things, I think, can help you feel um, more um, empowered to be able to be informed. Um, and I also think it's really important to encourage kids to stand up if they see something wrong. Um, I think you know, when we talk about social norms and sort of what they've grown up with. And um, if they sense that something's not right for them to stand up and speak up, um, and if they can't handle it or if they need help to then come to us um, as adults and that we will help them. And if we can't help them, we'll find somebody who can. Um, to Just because I think um, when kids do speak up about difficult topics, if it falls on deaf ears with adults and if they don't see the adults doing something about it or attempting to, to approach a next step, um, then they're not gonna come and talk to us again, right? So I think it's really important to let them know that, that we're, we're willing to help them and listen to them and then um, to do everything we can to, to assist them with that. 
Great, thank you for that. Um, maybe over to Jeff uh, from the perspective of a principal. Um, you know, what kinds of things can can parents across Grand Erie be doing um, to be allies and to support our students? Thanks, Jenny. I think uh, you know. I, I think of a couple of things. Um, you know, even from our, our younger students, when they hear their parents or their you know their loved adults in their life talking to other loved adults about these important topics, then, you know, the, you know, little kids are like sponges. <laughs> so they'll, they'll absorb all of that good stuff. So I think having those, you know, uh, challenging conversations in age appropriate ways with, with, with your, with your own, you know, children in your care um, and with the other adults around you, I think is, is really important. It's that modeling um, that they, that they can see and do. And if you don't know um, how to do that, it's okay to reach out and do that reading um, to, to do that. I think the other, the other critical thing I think that's important is that, um, you know, I think of our students who may identify, um, who are non-gender conforming, um, who may be on, you know, identify as part of the LGBTQ um, community, is, is, is that having those opportunities to hear um, you as the caregivers speak positively and trying to understand <clears throat> others, whether that's from entertainment news or whatever, um, to hear the, you talk about those in a positive way may provide that safe space at home um, in order for them to continue to explore who they are. Um, and that's particularly in the adolescent years. Um, I think that's really important in terms of that perspective. Um, and then being open and, 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 you know, you know, und with your choice, you know, having those conversations with the school teachers and, 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 you know, administrators or social workers or guidance counselors or whoever your, you know, your student finds as a, a caring adult in the building um, and opening up those lines of communication, I think is really important for supporting the students. Um, sometimes I find us as, you know, sometimes it's hard for us now sometimes not to get our backs up about things. Well, no, I'm a good person. I don't think that way, but really, you know, checking yourself and understanding that you may not totally understand how your actions affect other people is, is really important. And then speaking, you know, very bluntly about that and being able to be called into the conversation. And, and saying, you know what, I wasn't right. Thank you for letting me know. Um, I'm going to do this in the future. I think all of those pieces are really important um, at home. And then that can translate into at school as well. Thanks for that, Jeff. Lots of great uh, suggestions there. Um, maybe we can go over to Jeannie. Um, what role do parents have? Uh, how can parents begin to um, start their own allyship journeys for their kids and their their kids' friends. Yeah, well, I do agree that it's important to, um, well, first of all, said you know, be mindful that our kids are always watching and listening. <laughs> you know, so we have to, um, you know, be um, paying attention to the messaging that we're giving them in our indirect communication. Um, so that's so very important. But the other thing is to, um, you know, I totally agree that we should be encouraging our kids to um, to stand up when they see something that isn't right. And, you know, that's great. But I think we also have to remember that they're kids or, you know, teenagers. And so, um, we, you know, we have to help them kind of problem solve, you know, and, and what are the options? You know, how can, what are the different ways you can stand up? So it's, so if we say stand up, what does that look like? And then, you know, what do they feel comfortable doing? What do they need us to do? You know, that's, a, that is kind of something I do with my own daughter. When something has occurred and she, you know, she comes to me and she needs assistance. It's like, okay, well you know, let's talk out the different how different ways you could react, you know, different action you could take. Um, but I always will give it back to her. You know, what, what what do you want to do? What do you need me to do? And um and that way kind of empower her to, you know, to take the steps that she feels comfortable taking. And but and always leaving it where 
OK, I'll leave that with you. But you if you need me to do anything, then you let me know because I you know, I do think it's I, important to empower our kids and to um, give them the tools to take the action that they they feel comfortable taking. But know that we're there if they need us. Yeah, for sure. And thank you for sharing that, you know, the anecdote from your life as a as a parent as well. Um, maybe I can throw this question over to Cassidy. Um, how can how can parents and guardians begin this work of allyship? Thanks, Jenny. I'm hearing plenty of excellent ideas. And, and as I kind of take the information in, I'm thinking about how parents and guardians can encourage their child to adopt a learning stance in their interactions with others um, and to truly show a vested interest in getting to know a person beyond those physical characteristics that we all see. Um, I think that's very important and it will help others to feel seen and heard. Indeed. Uh, maybe I can put this question to Coach Joe as well. Um, Joe, what do you think in terms of uh, parents and allyship? It's um, it's a timely question that we had in one of the many Teams meetings we've had past. Uh, a staff member shared with me that he thinks, uh, uh, one, and I agree with him, um, having that um, empathetic characteristic, um, putting yourself in other people's situations, um, how they're how they're acting, what they're what they're being like, and, and not just not just students, but other staff members as well, um, and, and 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 trying to put yourself in, in that situation. We try to do it with our kids as well here, um, and when you're you're talking about empathy and and, and relationships and 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 accepting change, um, when things change in your school or your teacher changes, just being being given those those tools to uh, to be able to to be a little more resilient. Um, to when things change because not everything stays the same and uh, um, I think that that's an important thing for uh, for our children to, to have when, when they're going to school and, and as, as they progress into life. For sure well said. Um, Jean I'm hoping maybe you can weigh in on this uh, this topic too. Uh, what can our parents and guardians at home do to to start this work of, of allyship um, and best support their their kids and their their kids friends? Yeah, th thanks for the opportunity to weigh in here. I think, you know, while many of us really understand that school historically and, and today have been spaces where our kids um, attend, right, to promote their opportunity and to support them to be, uh, you know, the best um, thriving human being that they can to pursue their dreams. The, the reality is that um, um, many of our schools are institutions that um, replicate much of the oppression that we see and reinforce the illnesses that we have in our society around inequity. And so the system of um, kind of structural oppression along the, the lines of race and poverty and, um, you know, uh, economic segregation that we have and anti-immigration sentiments that we have are often replicated in schools unless the teaching and, and um, uh, uh, academic establishment uh, doesn't do deep anti-racist and anti-oppressive kind of practice work. So I think we, we as parents have to really get more engaged and, and not let our schools off the hook, right? And, and so we have to call ourselves in as parents to say, how can I become more engaged? And school councils are a pivotal space where I think the voice of parents can be situated to help to dismantle, interrupt, and deconstruct some of this structural oppression that we see. So in order to do that, parents have to be actively listening and understanding the issues. So they've got to be doing their own work and their own research to understand the history of the struggle outside of their own lived experience and to acknowledge that maybe in some ways as parents, we are participating in structural oppression. And so what can we do in our privileged space to amplify is those voices that have been historically sort of suppressed? And, and we do that by centering our, our work to become deeper allies and not get so um, upset when we're called in or even when we make mistakes and trip up on ourselves. As I said, I'm a recovering heterosexist, so I will make mistakes and, and I will be in recovery for the better part of my life journey, because 
just of the way I was socialized. So, you know, let's not beat up on ourselves, but let's always continue to do a lot better because what we don't understand is as parents, as human beings, when we don't get the issues of inequity uh, for marginalized individuals and we, we don't understand our privilege, we are actually robbing ourselves of our own humanity. And I ask every parent, what type of human being do you wanna be in 2021? Excuse me. For thought there. Thank you. Excuse Hi, Eva. Me. Hi. I've had my hand up for a little bit. I just wanted to mention, I'm a trustee. That doesn't matter. Uh, what Catherine was saying is so important that the children feel that the teachers are open to listen to them. And I mean, really listen to them. I think that's so important. Well, Eva, thank you for that. And your comment has provided the perfect segue as we're about, uh, we've got about 15 minutes or so left in this virtual event. At this point, we'd like to invite members of the audience to ask any questions at all that are on their minds. Uh, this is a safe space we're hoping to create here. Um, so feel free to either virtually raise your hand uh, that's up there at the top somewhere. Um, you can turn your camera on, uh, say hello if you would like to. Um, and I'm hoping maybe we can uh, call on Christine too, if there's any questions that are appearing in that chat field. Um, it does look like we will have maybe a list of book recommendations uh, by the end of this event. So um, maybe we can uh, scour the comments for, for some of those incredible books that are being recommended too. Um, but let's open the floor up uh, if you have a question for any of our panelists or all of our panelists um, about this topic tonight or any aspects of it. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jenny. It's Christine here. I just wanted to say we did get a good uh, comment from one of our participants who said that it would have been nice to have a parent on the panel tonight. So that's something that we can consider, uh, you know, for the future. But that is something that somebody mentioned. Just wanted to bring that yep. up. Yep, very, uh, very good point. Um, and absolutely, we'll uh, we'll take that uh, that feedback as we uh, as we move forward with planning events uh, for our parent communities. It looks like Trustee David Dean has a question. Um, Dave, if you want to unmute your mic and even come yes. on camera, feel free. I'll do my best. There are a lot of buttons here that I can press. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say a couple of things in uh, backing up what Jeff Bennett was saying earlier, and that is uh, how he, as a principal, would like to see the <clears throat> this, this, the uh, student body uh, match the uh, teaching body, if if you like, the way there are <clears throat> um, many Six Nations children, perhaps, in, in a school, um, and but no. Six, no, um, until recently, uh, Six Nations students. And I think it, it's important to point out that, uh, you know, people want the boards of education to do something about it. Well, until just this last month or two, they haven't been able to, because in 2012, the government at that time brought in a regulation called Regulation 274, which required school boards to hire people based on seniority and seniority alone. And that is why it's going to be very hard to, to, uh, to get to what, to Jeff's goal that he's talking about, where the staff reflects the student body. But I, I think it's important to note that that's not, the, the boards were powerless to do anything about that. Uh, and, uh, but now they're not. So it'll be interesting to see the next move that the uh, the government's taken. I think they want to take so that the school's uh, teaching staff reflects the student body. Sorry if I was too long. Not at all. No, thank you. And that uh, kind of harkens back to our discussion about how schools, school boards, as as sort of these big institutions, um, certainly perpetuate and reinforce some of the racism and marginalization that uh, that certainly exists in our societies. Um, does anyone on our panel want to weigh in on that? We also have Sabrina Sawyer has her hand up. All right, Sabrina, feel free to uh, unmute your mic or say hello on camera, whatever you're comfortable with. Morning, everyone. So I just wanted to piggyback on what Trustee Dean 
had just shared. While yes, the Regulation 274 impacts permanent hiring, but OTs, absolutely the board has control over the number of OTs that they hire from diverse communities. And that's where the power in hiring comes from. So it's really important that we take opportunity and engage in some of those hiring fairs that happen across the province. So that we're bringing in a diversity that we're making sure that even within our own community, we have a budgeting South Asian community here. What are we doing to hire those South Asian OTs to make sure that they rise into those positions of LTOs and then into permanent positions? The, the ministry has lifted 274. So right now it, it does lay on the board to make sure that they engage in that hiring practice to ensure that we have diverse hiring for that representation across the school. So I just wanted to add that piece that the ministry has lifted those um, barriers, but it's really important that we own that and uh, that we really take part in how are we advertising across the province so that we're seeing a diversity in communities that we're accessing for the teachers that are representing in our communities. Really good point. And OTs, and of course, refers to occasional teachers, um, which is sort of uh, your your foot in the door of the school board. And, and certainly, um, as you've pointed out, a, a lot of control there in terms of how we shape the way um, our, our, our staff looks in, in future generations to come. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this topic? I was going to it's Eva again. Um, we can also have them as EAs, which gets their foot in the door and, and it gets them there yeah i just i would add um jen if i could um it goes back to um, this is an opportunity like sabrina said we have an opportunity but are we going to do things the same way we've always done you know it goes back to the comment that jean made that you cannot continue to do things the same way and expect a different outcome so we really have to be in you know, if we're serious about um, creating a more diverse uh, workforce in our board, then we have to be very intentional at, about looking at how we've been doing things and, you know, creative and, and doing it, changing it up, you know, from everything for, to, you know, how we recruit, the, the, the um, job fairs we go to, um, you know, where we post ads, how we post ads, like right, everything, you know, who's on interview committees, uh, the language that's used in postings. So I think that, you know, there's lots of room to be creative to ensure we um, bring people in uh, into our board so that we uh, can create a more diverse workplace so that our students, you know, um, regardless of where they're coming from, can see themselves, you know, in our, in their teachers, in their, in, in the office, you know, in, in their, in their classrooms, in their hallways. And so I think that is so important for our students to see um, their own communities reflected in, in their schools, in, in the staff that is um, working with them. Yeah, really good points. And um, our panelist, Catherine, just pointed out as well that she's noticed much more diversity in the occasional teachers we have had at our school this year. Catherine, anything else you want to add to that or? Are we good? No, that was it. I just it's been really nice to see um, because I think it is much more reflective of, of our student body and it's nice for the kids to see those role models. So definitely I've seen a lot more diversity this year. Great. It looks like we've got a couple of hands up. Christine, maybe uh, I can ask you to do some air traffic control for uh thank you jenny so susan gibson hi there so i'm asking this question as actually as a parent because i think a lot of our audience is parents today so i'm just wondering if the panelists have some good suggestions as to asking those deep questions when our students come home from school and what we can do to continue to further our learning i know as a parent uh with a lot of the reading that my kids have done i choose to read along with them and ask and learn more questions. But are there other suggestions from our panelists how we can ourselves learn with our students and enhance their learning as well? Uh, 
I Hi, can speak I think, to that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jean. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to um, comment that perhaps this is the perfect opportunity to bring in families from the community to go on that learning journey with their child, the students in the classroom setting. Um, we can't forget that a lot of our, our parents offer unique opportunities um, that we can draw on and, and welcome them into the, the school setting on. Well said, Jean, I think you had something to add to that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it, it, you really have to be um, understanding at the age level that your child is at, right? Because this can be some heavy kind of um, conversation to be having with, with young children. But there are good um, uh, young children's books that you uh, uh, can get from libraries around issues of uh, inclusion and, and, and space for all. I also think that there's uh, opportune uh, space where, you know, even watching a movie and, and the selections of uh, the types of movies and the types of shows that um, you watch with your family and, and, and try to switch that up a bit and, and ensure that you're doing it and, it, and doing it from a, a, um, a diverse perspective. And then um, having conversation about what the movie was about and what they notice and what they feel is, is ways that you can have um, conversations around uh, diversity and inclusion uh, with, with uh, younger children in particular. So it doesn't always have to be this kind of academic experience. Uh, but we can use other forms of um, um, learning tools to, to engage and dive into this dialogue. Well said. Um, do any of our other panelists want to uh, address this uh, really interesting question that Susan's raised with us? Let's follow what Jean said about, about different things on TV. I was introduced to this show this year called Chuck and the First People's Kitchen on APTN. Um, I had never seen it before, but I don't miss it now because it, it, we're really focusing on the land-based learning aspect of our of our curriculum this year, and that that show speaks to it every week. Um, and, and as well, um, again, about the thing about did you know, um, our board website has an enormous amount of resources um, in the education, our safe and inclusive schools page. Um, Stuff that everybody has, well, who has access to internet and computer, I guess. Um, it's it's a it's a lot of information on those on those sites. Yeah, I was actually looking at those pages today, and there's been a tremendous amount added. Um, so yeah, the Grand Erie website is a great place to get started um, for some of those resources for sure. And I'll just add. Um, I'm just a, a strong believer in the power of relationship. You know, it doesn't always have to be um, understanding that comes from something, I guess, external to us. But, you know, I think it's important for us to look for ways, opportunities to create relationships with others. And um, I can't really come up with any example. I mean, our kids have a lot. I mean, I, I, I just kind of get the sense in our conversation here that we're, we're, we see it as... Um, the other is out there, so and we can only learn about them through media or books or no, like they could be our neighbor, you know, they're they're the family down the street. They're the, you know, our the classmates in our child's classroom. So maybe we can, you know, as parents look for um, ways to um, foster relationships with others. And um, because I do think that that's the best way to create better understanding between us is to actually get to know each other better. Um, maybe something as simple as, um, you know, I grew up on the on Six Nations and sometimes I've always found it interesting how people, you know, I, when I would go in school or even people that I work with who grew up in this area have never been to the reserve. You know, well, there you go. It's, it's right there. Um, you know, go for a visit. Yeah, really good point. 
I think, Christine, we might have um, time for another question. Uh, I think there's a hand raised. Yeah, it's uh, Tala Andradis from our Safe and Inclusive Schools Committee and one of our ELL team, Tala. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be here tonight. And uh, Jeannie kind of started with my idea, but I was going to talk about relationships. And um, I think uh, schools, uh, a lot of schools in our community, uh, not during this time because of COVID, but a lot of schools in the past have done tremendous job building relationships with the communities, not necessarily linked to academic activities or things like that, but just, uh, you know, like a, like a fun fair. And then, you know, having, um, we used to have like these, you know, fun auctions where, where kids and the parents come into the school environment, but for, you know, for different activities that are not related to, to, to education. And, and not to say that, you know, that's a bad thing. However, you know, sometimes, you know, to build those strong relationships, it has to be in an environment where parents feel safe, that are not going to be judged in regards to how much they know about or understand the curriculum. It has to be separate from, from that, you know, in order to be that, to build that relationship with the families. And just to, to you know, to, to get to know each other, to invite parents into the schools, especially, you know, that, well, my portfolio is supporting English language learners, but, you know, to invite them to read to the kids in another language, to share their stories, to, you know, to share their food celebrations. Like there is so many opportunities. Again, not this time because we have a lot of limitations, but technology has also brought a lot of opportunities to do things in different ways and we can we can be, be creative. A lot of people talk about creativity and as educators, we I think we have that gift about being creative and we can come up with things like that. But, um, but relationships is number one, then, if we want change, it usually starts from the heart and then, you know, move, you move forward from that. Really good really point, Tatala, and lots to look forward to when uh, when it's safe to, uh, to gather again and uh, experience otherness that way as well. Um, it's always the case that the discussion really picks up just as we're running out of time with these sort of events. Uh, but we hope this discussion tonight has been really helpful and, and maybe even empowering for, uh, for our audience members. I wanna thank our panelists for sharing their insights, their expertise, their experiences with us. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to thank Sarah Nickel and the Grand Erie Parent Involvement Committee for their hard work in planning tonight's event. This hasn't been an easy year and they've managed to pivot and bring really meaningful, well-programmed events to the virtual space. And if you didn't know, this event is part of a series of weekly virtual events happening this month. So if you're not sure what else is on offer, be sure to check it out. I'd also like to thank Christine Bibby of Grand Erie Safe and Exclusive Schools team for all her help in bringing together our panel tonight. And of course, I'd like to thank all of the parents and guardians at home Thank you so much for joining us. We know this has been a challenging year to say the least, and we're in awe of the incredible efforts you're doing on the home front to support your kids during this time. I hope everyone stays safe during what is hopefully the last leg of this pandemic, and we can't wait to see you in person sometime soon when it's safe. Thanks very much everyone and have a fantastic evening. is now exiting. Great Good job, night. Jenny. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jenny. Great job. It was a great event. Thanks to everyone. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Jenny, for taking the reins on that, too. My pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jenny. Great work. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Sarah, for, um, you know, for this topic and for having the courage to put it forward. Thank you so much. So glad that there were so many people here too. It was wonderful to see. That was great. And for anyone still here, there's so many good book recommendations in the chat. If you've got a pen handy, jot them down. Lots of good lockdown reading. <laughs>